I wanted this conversation to be a little bit more relaxed and to focus on your collaboration together and how you're faring right now as image makers in this time of social isolation. Normally we meet in the museum's vault and we look at prints together that are in the museum's collection, but since we're separated, you have a print up right now. First of all, I, I feel like I'm maybe trapped in a Mr. Rogers neighborhood episode because this is coming from my living room and I'm casually <laughs> dressed. And so uh, anyhow, this particular image I made in 1964. I wanted, basically I wanted to uh, create a sequence of images uh, that would end up within one image rather than uh, stringing out from left to right three images or four images. As you can see, I photographed uh, on Polaroid the uh, image from a, a distance. So it is kind of a, a short journey as I moved toward this tree. Uh, then I placed the, the first image uh, onto the bark of the tree and made a second image on Polaroid. And then placed that on to the bark for the final two and a quarter inch film image. And I think I was probably influenced by some of the work of uh, Edgerton, perhaps, who did a lot of motion studies of athletes and, and which the, uh, the sequential time was recorded within one image. Also, I think, Ben, when you talk about your logic class and how that led you to be the most expedient about how to get somewhere in the most uh, direct way yeah, yeah. informed your decision to how can I make a sequence within one image? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That expediency of um, a kind of a Swedish sense of design and aesthetic also. Mm -hmm. There was a, a, a study made uh, to find out the very basic use of objects. And one study was the use of a pencil. And uh, pencils were given to a group of children. And they were asked what, what they were best suited for, or made for doing, using. And people would say, draw or uh, write uh, uh, words. And then finally, one person said to make marks. I, I always admired that kind of way of uh, getting down to the very pure use of something. Have you ever tried other mediums? Because when I look at this image that you have up right now, I think of music and I think of the notes repeating. And I studied painting in, in my background and I've never tried to be limited to the to the camera because I find it frustrating that you can only do so much. Of course, you can do so much more. You have to be very inventive and creative like yourself, but with your interest in rhythm and kind of repetition, have you ever tried other materials or has it always been about the camera? The use of found objects, uh, sculptural ideas. I'm very fond of music. I, I listen to it a great deal, enjoy it very much, and I, I'm sure it's influenced my work in some way. I, I'm not sure exactly how, but maybe you observing can understand maybe some kind of connection more than I would. This was made by Ken in a time when um, that kind of um, reference of the photograph was being displaced from being the equivalence of the landscape and um, a sense of an experiential reality equivalent to the vastness of um, the mountains or um, truth itself, that that interruption of the frame or that the image about the image making it self-referential was uh, made at a time where it was violating the previous rules. So it was a, um, a, a violation in that introduction of the hand 
was a violation and he felt a gut response. But as this photograph was made, it's Chicago, 1964. It's an image of a tree within the tree closer, within an image of a tree closer. And so it uh, speaks to the recursive patterning of representation, which speaks to fractals. And fractals was first used by mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot in 1975. So this was made before fractal was named and brought to the public awareness, but it's so about that. And so that's interesting about has artists intuitively absorb in this kind of um, uh, collective consciousness. What we make as images are also where we're at in terms of this being human. And the idea of a holograph, what's one in the whole, is like what Rumi said when he goes, he wrote to us, Rumi's a 13th century Islamic poet, mystic, lover of humanity. And he wrote, you are not a drop in the ocean, you are the entire ocean in a drop. And I love that you chose this example to talk about your work and then the other that i understand you're going to talk about is of your son holding a photograph yeah. and yeah. thinking about a lot of things you both were just saying i feel like that image now has new meaning for me too about family and this idea of your children sort of being like part of your own fractal like i've never thought of parenthood in that well, way this image of um, my son matthew he was two years old at the time and i was uh, out with him uh, uh, making some Polaroid images. And uh, I also had my 35 millimeter camera with me. And uh, as he was, uh, I was showing him the images, he would pick them up and look at them. And, and then he suddenly put that one up to his face. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I made a, a 35 millimeter image of him doing that. And he was mimicking uh, uh, the way I was holding the camera with his finger on the, what would be the shutter release. And uh, he could, because there's the, the image on the paper is translucent, he could see see through it uh, of course not when it was right up to his face but he was thinking i think uh, he was making an image with a camera or using the, the image as a camera mm -hmm. and fortunately he had it upside down which is like where the image is inside of a camera of course mm -hmm. uh, so it see. it all came together i thought uh, Unexpectedly, I didn't uh, plan this out or anything. It just happened. It speaks to you know the, uh, the child's curiosity and um, playfulness and uh, all the things that little children are are made of. <laughs> yeah, and you photograph your family quite a bit, right? And your children. Um, was that always for you just a natural thing or a natural process or um, did it feel different to you photographing them versus photographing architecture and landscape and the other types of things you do? Oh, I, I, I was spent an awful lot of time um, with my children when they were quite young and uh, they just provided all kinds of situations for me to photograph. And uh, I wanted to, I wanted them to be as universal universal as possible that people could relate to their own experiences with their own children. You also made a, a joke when we last spoke about someone telling a, a person that their, their child was really cute and you said, if you think she's cute now, you should see her photograph. <laughs> so I'm probably messing it up. But <laughs> yeah, that, uh, yeah, right. Essentially, that was <laughs> right. it. Yeah. Right. Right. That we can kind of see new forms in the photograph and in a different <laughs> version of reality. I love that. Is, is this okay? Is it glare or not? Is it okay? Yeah, it looks fine. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, 
I was out walking my camera when I was in uh, Sweden. This was done in um, 1967, I believe. And there had been a, uh, uh, a short uh, snowfall and the weather was such that uh, the sun would um, come out periodically and it, um, of course, melted everything surrounding this uh, uh, area except for the shadow which remained cold, of course. And uh, I thought it was a, just a perfect example of a positive negative relationship in the uh, photographic process and that it was just kind of magical that it appeared that way. Uh, I have friends in California and when looking at this, uh, I remember one person said, that was a great idea using flour on the, on the, <laughs> on the street. <laughs> That's, there are a lot of them that have never experienced snow. You know. And in the process, he has a lot of different views of this. So it was interesting to see other images with um, close-ups with a man's legs walking by. And so I think that's important that these things are found by exploring in all different points of view in that way that photography can so animate that. Now this one was more, um, uh, pre I, I, more prepared. At, I, I couldn't necessarily choose the traffic going by, but um, I wanted to speak about how the camera isolates things in space and frames them and takes them out of context. And that, of course, a lot of other things are happening all around whatever is being isolated. Um, and uh, so it, it kind of explains itself by showing that this is not a picture, but a, a empty frame, you know, mm -hmm. and reference back to like self, kind of a self portrait. Uh, and it, it, it has this instantaneous quality to it that I like. And that's analog. So that's like click, click. It's not like the continuous drive where you can just take several right away with digital. So that's always interesting when he has these complex compositions. I enjoy humor. <laughs> and this is kind of a tribute to all these people that are <laughs> near airports and, and are constantly oh. being uh, uh, affected by the noise. <laughs> but it also speaks to when um, the father and the daughter were sitting in an airport watching planes take off. Yeah. Uh, and so, and uh, do you want to give the punchline? So, yeah. And uh, so the daughter was watching these planes take off. And when they boarded their plane and after they took off, she turned to her father and said, when are we going to be become f smaller? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you heard someone say that? Yeah. I love that. <laughs> so that in inspired. <laughs> oh, and then one time, Ken woke up. Well, he didn't wake up. He, he, he spoke very clearly, s sleeping. So he was, was totally in a dream. And, and he said, I can draw with the wingtip of an airplane. Just recently, or that happened? Yeah, within our yeah. Yeah, within. that's that's really poetic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can't read it, but the switch is it says on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In this, one. okay. So it's kind of self-explanatory. Yeah, <laughs> I get the joke. <laughs> dry humor. It's the yeah. Swedish dry humor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Title is. Uh, conceived in 1969, born in 2012. Nice. <laughs> in a dream, maybe. <laughs> well, I, I had thought about it a long time, and I never got around to doing it <laughs> until later. 
And the title of this is, uh, she would not remove her hat for months. <laughs> it's kind of a chia pet. Hat. Chia pet hat. <laughs> what is the the pattern on the top? Is that her standing in front of a mural or? Mm -hmm. It's a mural, a wall mural. mural. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I have various hats and but hoods. It, 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 it kind of, and it repeats the lines of the hat. Mm -hmm. That's and why I, I chose it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Plus the rays, like the rays of sun or light. Mm -hmm. And then I chose the striped. So I have a vast wardrobe to choose from of patterns and mostly black and white. So I, I, I purchase clothes thinking about photographs or thinking about. And I have as many hats as I am old, mm -hmm. and I have a lot of wigs. Mm -hmm. So I have a brunette wig, so I could make this real, mm -hmm. or believable, and um, and uh, was uh, was uh, a sense of whatever I can do to facilitate this to be believable. And there was this image. Yeah. I love it. This is the one you told me about yesterday when <laughs> we talked. <laughs> it's great. Would you like to describe it or would you? Sure, yeah. So we see um, just from the neck down a woman's shirt and her cleavage is poking out with four photo corners attached to her body around the cleavage, framing it. It's great. I love it. I've never seen this one, but you told me about it. Well, this is more a while ago. The, the one that we... Um, no, this it? is 2008. Yeah. Um, but, uh, the but, last one was more recent. It was like last year. Last year, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so we've been together um, 13 years, but we've been friends. Uh, we met at the Art Institute, so we've known each other since 76. Mm -hmm. So we stayed friends all this time. It's really good to be friends for decades before you become partners. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody's life. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> But Especially right now, as we're all stuck indoors with one another. <laughs> so, this reminds me, though, of an older piece that you made that we have in our collection, though, where it's it's more just on her, like uh, I guess, like underwear region. I don't know how to describe it so much, but like you have a, a photograph on top of a woman's body where she's clothed and then nude in the photograph, laying on top of her body. Yeah, um, yeah. So is that the, the Sally one with the? Yeah, with the Polaroid. Polaroid looking through her clothes, mm -hmm. right? Everybody wants that one because it's actually like looking through one's clothing, like how, you know, men unconsciously dress women or there's just that. And so when Ken got um, a corrective lens surgery, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And um, so when we came back to get the um, um, overview of how successful the operation was, um, Ken thanked the um, surgeon. surgeon for also uh, conducting the surgery so that he could now see through women's clothing like he always wanted to. And the doctor <laughs> was right there on the joke and said, I'm glad you are giving me that gratitude, but keep it a secret. <laughs> <laughs> you were knocking down his door. <laughs> no, right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I love about this photograph and the other one that we were talking about is you're sort of calling out, I think, a very common pattern with um, male photographers photographing women and yeah. maybe using the camera as an excuse to get them undressed for the camera. Right. So I love that, that, that humor again, but it's also like a, a sort of dark humor because we know how real these types of photographs are and we've seen them so much. I'm, I'm wearing a top but I just have um, sheer pantyhose on mm -hmm. um, if you look closer. Um, but uh, I love it also because um, I mean it's, it's, the, it's the male gaze but it's, um, it's double coded because there's the reference to the, um, the, the body the, the figural form and the snapshot too, and, which men are so enamored by. But then he has and this okay, and then the and then with the photo corners, right? Like the snapshot that is so um, the sense of in family albums and everybody's uh, images of their family and that context of the everyday use of the camera. Mm -hmm. So it it collapses that and makes it a 
a photograph about photography, about the history of photography. It's interesting, like, as you were talking about it, it made me think too about one of my favorite photos in our collection by Harry Callahan of Eleanor's backside, and it's super overexposed and cropped in. So kind of her, the lines from her legs and her buttocks, like kind of meeting looks like a tree and it's just like a really dark yeah. kind of charcoal line almost. So this is really interesting because I know you studied under Callahan oh, and you have this whole like history of photography series. That's a whole different thing we haven't talked about yet. But for me, like the history of photography is kind of right there in that framing that I hadn't thought of until you started yeah. talking about the minimalism. And, and like, and this isn't Polaroid, but the use of Polaroid, uh, I think, uh, 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 I'm not sure if Dr. Land really intended this, but uh, it was uh, very useful for pornography mm -hmm. because you could bypass the processing houses. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah, you're, you're not having another set of eyes on the things you're making. And people at camera stores used to talk about happy couples buying the SX-70 and he knew what their intent was. <laughs> I really liked this image that was made. And there's a sense of um, earlier work was all about patterning of, uh, that I made, and combining different elements that had similar patterns. And so, and I love black and white, and I love that sense of that energy. Ken chose this background, but we're on call for this animated background. So we're always canvassing the, um, the city for such. And so I dressed for this animating pattern as much as I could and layering it and then actually having layers of clothing that I would take off to give different options. So it was like a strip. I was stripping down as I, as, and this was on the set, this is on a busy street and people were driving by like waving and clapping and, you know, <laughs> and this one fell into that sense of a kind of a aesthetic click because compositionally it, it just, things lined up in such a harmony. And so we share a sense of an aesthetic click for that. And, you know, this top of the boot aligns up with this. And so there's that rigor of composition or the, or the, the gloves are just right where this falls and the gloves drop for that. Or this knee becomes inexplicable. Like, what is that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and then somehow the pattern of the hat. So it just, it just has a sense of a totality that, just speaks to my extroverted energy that and my sense of um being out there and and present to others but it also speaks to an interiority so i really like it in terms of that sense of um who we are as human beings so how do you all when you're photographing together how do you work out your two personality types if if Marilyn's more of an extrovert and Ken, you're more of an introvert and you're both artists and you're making images together, is there a long negotiation process or is it pretty natural? It seems to be pretty natural. Uh, pretty much flows. Mar Marilyn will come up with an idea, especially through her clothing. Uh, uh, and I'll have an idea of uh, how the image uh, should be posed, uh, and we work together on it, it usually. So, so this is like our, out. actually, uh, Jennifer Norback put this together when we had a show. The gallery at, owner. The gallery owner, Jennifer Norback, at their gallery. We had a show, and it was about the photographs that we collaborated on, and it was, and then the sense of referencing Marilyn. So as Ken's um, makes photographs about photographs, so he, um, he was meta before meta, was Meta, as uh, Chris Borelli coined when he wrote about him. So I'm, I'm like Meta Marilyn. Like, um, <laughs> my dad said that he named us all after movie stars. And I have an older brother named John Wayne Zimmerman. And <laughs> when Marilyn Monroe committed suicide, I was nine and I came home. And my dad, I mean, all, all day I was teased like, um, I was a majorette. I went to majorette practice and all of the little girls, like when I came to practice, they all ran away saying, she's a ghost. She's a ghost. So everybody was projecting Marilyn onto me. <laughs> and then I came home and my dad who adored me and was a workaholic, alcoholic as every 
1960s white collar worker was largely a wild boy trying to be in that kind of sense of that constrictive uh, workforce to a wild man and the wild boy inside. So he, so he greeted me. And then first words he said was, don't you ever do what she did. Don't you ever give up. You're just like her. You're just like her. You're beautiful. You're talented. Don't you ever, ever give up. And I was nine. <laughs> yeah. And so that kind of cultural download and, you know, and I got that I had a lot of, I didn't know why boys were enamored with me. I'd always have when most, because I was coated with the blonde hair and the big full lips and the smile, I was coated physically, blessed by my mother's looks. To hold that iconic projection. Mm -hmm. But I grew up in a time of feminism where I could surpass the limitations that she had culturally and, and evolve through the 60s into my own self agency. And I had a sister who was 10 years older who graduated in 1960. And as Ken can testify in his peer group growing up, and my sister, that's where you had to get married to have a respected sexual life. So growing up of age with the feminist movement, the sexual revolution, the, 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 the peace movement, the, the entitlement to, to uh, subversion and to cultural change and being an agent of that was very empowering. And I have a girlfriend who has long dark hair and is more uh, different body type. And she was Marilyn Minsky and she was at a bar thinking about her name and she didn't want to hold that projection. And so she changed her name to Tequila Minsky. <laughs> <laughs> she's a great photographer living in New York. Okay. And, and for my agency as a feminist I changed my name from Zimmerman to Zimmerwoman legally mm -hmm. to own that entitled to own that name because I was in that transitional second wave of feminism where I collided against all those stereotypes of sexual harassment um, misinterpretation of the photographs of my daughter in the nude as pornography made by a radical feminist professor teaching photography from a feminist point of view during the culture wars of the 90s. So, so we have a menage a trois and we're both um, devoted to photography. So, so in our mutual passion for each other and photography, we created this love story. And, and so here's when they had the iconic Marilyn downtown and there's everybody was photographed it was like the tourist place where everybody was photographing her between their legs or guys would stand between their legs look pointing up mm -hmm. like yeah. that was a visual joke and so so we went down there with the camera and we went down there at night with a flash and we went down there several times and photographed it and it's repeated image with i'm holding the image of marilyn in front of me as i'm underneath her <laughs> and, um, so this is a photograph where i got dressed as provocatively as I could, and as animated in pattern, even having different, different patterns of pantyhose on different legs. Mm -hmm. I only have two legs, but. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Looks like so many more. <laughs> and then the image of Marilyn on my lap. And then, and then, and then here's like other images of me. And there's a, a there's books of Marilyn and Joe DiMaggio. And so, and, and the, the, those are our bed sheets that were, gifted to us by a granddaughter who knew our aesthetic. So, so I created, I said, here, here, I presented myself to Ken's camera, mm -hmm. here to the male gaze, here, we, here I am. And, and then, so that's much of how some of this was constructed in terms of my dressing and then my you know, placing myself and, um, and that kind of exploration and playfulness. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there's that shoe that has a zebra stripe. So, so yes, we get furniture to animate in terms of the patterns and we collect this together. And uh, there's, a, there's a book, there's Joe DiMaggio. There's a book about their love story. My peer group were the, was the me generation that was the first to download the television, the, our own uh, sense of our own peer um, 
group of music and, and, and the media, and then increasingly the media is so influential to us in terms of who we are as a human being that, and, are, and then we're evolving with this so that we have inherited families. So this is my inherited sense of identity that I had to incorporate and I could own it and work with it and move it beyond and carry her with me. This was another photograph. This is bigger. I think we have to make, make a, like, where can you see this? Mm -hmm. Does it work? Yeah. Is this, that like that? Yeah. And I've seen this one online. I love it. It, it really reminds me of this artist, Natalie Crick. I don't know if you've seen her work, but I'll send you her link. It's fantastic. She plays a lot with um, photographing her mother and herself and the prints oh, yes, on right, it. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yes. And, um, and so this is another one that I go, I go, here, we, here I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it was like that, this is our backyard. And it was all of that. And I placed myself there. And, and I have my, my sunglasses that have that pattern. And, and, and there's Ken's shadow. So there's that's a sense that because we both a stalker. <laughs> <laughs> we just can, we can just confluence and find that third way so easily. Mm -hmm. It's always about humor and fun and, and that sense of visual pleasure mm -hmm. and uh, celebration of our, of, our, of, of our pure delight in each other and then loving the same things, loving photography, loving um, the same sense of aesthetic click. When we go to museums, we are drawn. It, it really does. There is a very harmonious sense of being together. You guys have sort of answered this. Have you been has the pandemic changed the way you've been making or have you been trying to photograph through this together in your home? I'm mainly photographing in the home. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's okay. Uh, we have very good, very interesting lighting uh, that uh, changes depending on the, the, the weather. Uh, and I augment it sometimes with uh, artificial light, but the, I've been able to photograph, uh, especially Marilyn, uh, during this time. A couple things I learned that I thought was important in my <clears throat> in my studies, and one was uh, uh, I, I studied with Minor White at, at RIT, and of course he um, wrote the book on the zone system, mm -hmm. and it was uh, torture learning it, uh, and the thing that I learned uh, that I really value is that he taught me that the scale of a photograph photographic paper is so much shorter than a film, and that you create the negative to fit the paper, and that if you have a uh, a good black value and a good white value, and it doesn't have to be large. All the gray areas fall into place and look rich. The other thing I learned was from Aaron Siskin, who talked about the, the print as being values on a piece of paper, and that uh, it uh, could be uh, set on fire or you could wrinkle it. <laughs> you could do all kinds of things with it. And that whatever the image was, was representational. It wasn't the object. He gave himself a lot of latitude because he would photograph things that didn't have a, a known value so that he was free to make things lighter, darker. Oh, okay, uh, right. This right, right, complete right. freedom, because right. like if you have skin right. tone in a in a photograph, right. Right. that kind of anchors it. You you're mm. stuck with mm. it. You you make it skin mm. tone value. Mm -hmm. But he had this freedom of making things. Uh, in most cases, you know. mm -hmm. there's one picture we have in our collection too of Chicago, of the lakefront, where you've woven sea prints and gelatin silver prints. And sort of, I think, playing with our perceptions of color and black and white. One of the things was I, I wanted to um, show the architectural changes um, uh, in, in the city, but also to uh, um, 
show the difference between color photography and black and white photography. Mm -hmm. How a different set of information is given, whether it's black and white or, or, um, or color. And black and white is pretty much confined to tonal values where uh, or color you know is um, mainly um, concerned with 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 the with the color of the objects uh, and the color of the light so i i, I just wanted to uh show differences mm -hmm. in the two mediums but thinking too about the ideas of photographic truth that your work is always so great to talk with students about that of all the different ways you could tell a story and the choices the artist makes and even just size or color these things that seem so I don't know, basic or not interesting and then you talk about just all the different ways then the person reads that image after you've made that choice and how it interpret or changes their idea of what that moment was it's interesting to me too because you don't have a lot of color work so it no. seems like it's not necessarily a critique but sort of declaring a preference Thank you.